Good evening from Nigeria. My name is Adin Rosso. Welcome to another special edition of the Mindfield Publishing Facebook interview series. Today I have a very special co-host. He is the author of The Bumbles and the Wadi, a number one Amazon bestseller. He is a pharmacist by training, a cryptocurrency expert. He's also an international consultant of repute. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Mark Shibuke Obabo. He's my co-host for today. Good evening. Um, good to be here with you, Adentu. I uh, look forward to a wonderful interview today. Yes, there he is, Mark Chibuke Obabo is my co-host for today. He is the author of The Bombos and the Wabbits. Uh, yeah, good evening. Thank you. You're Adentu. welcome, Mark. All right. Good to see you, and I hope we'll have a great interview today. Yes, today we have a very special guest in our midst. He's a small business owner, a comedian, and what have you. He's a, he's a man of many parts. I'm talking about Will Nestle from Colorado, USA. Will, you're welcome. I am very glad to be here, Edentu and Dr. Mark. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Will. So let's keep the ball rolling. As a writer, you've had moments where you had the compulsive need to tell a story. What would you say is the underlying rhythm, on the underlying uh, that would get under guess your writing? What exactly is it? What is? Sorry, the. Not sure I understood the question. What drives you when you write? What drives also, me? What um, thank you. I That question I do understand. Um, I was, I'm fortunate, fortunate enough to know that God put me here to write. It's what I have been given to do. And uh, after an embarrassingly long time working at it, I actually have gotten to a point where I feel like I'm doing it pretty well. And so um, what drives me to write is the sheer joy of creation. And uh, it's a blessing to be able to say that because I've always loved writing, but it's only recently that I've found a lot of joy in doing so. So for writers out there that have the passion and are hoping to find the joy, I believe if you keep up, keep it up, if you keep at it, the passion, the joy is there to be found. Mark, you have any questions for Will? Yeah, um, Will, I, we, 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 all, we all like, okay, people who are into this creative world sometimes want to put down thoughts on paper, but sometimes it doesn't go very well. I don't know how that has been with you. I think that's what they call the writer's block sometimes. I don't know whether it has happened to you. And if it has, how have you been able to overcome it? Writer's block. Yes. I, I think that phrase, that expression can mean different things. But in general, having trouble getting, getting something from my head down on paper definitely uh, have experienced that. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I don't think it happens much anymore, and I'm not entirely sure why. Um, I do know that for the first 20 years that I was writing, I started when I was 10 years old, and uh, I'm now in my 40s, so I've been writing for a while. For the first 20 years, nothing I wrote was ever good enough. Um, it didn't matter if I wrote five exciting pages, I would beat myself for not writing six. It didn't matter if I figured out what a character's motivation was, I would be upset with myself for not having figured it out earlier. Nothing was ever good enough. And that was, that was a psychological problem. That was uh, something I had to deal with. And 
God was gracious and led me into dealing with it. And I have to a large extent. And that might be why writer's block isn't such a thing for me anymore. Partly because I give myself more room to breathe. And if I hit a day where I just don't feel like writing, I will make myself not write. Um, rather than the opposite, which was chaining myself to a desk and whipping myself, uh, metaphorically speaking. Instead, now I'm like, okay, if you don't feel like writing, I won't let you write today. You don't get to. And usually within a couple hours, I'll think, boy, I really wanted to find out what happened next. And I'll be like, well, only if you really want to. And then I get back to it and suddenly the words are there. So at least for me, writer's block has no longer been a thing ever since I stopped expecting myself to write perfectly. I don't know how useful that might be. Okay. Um, we, you are a primary caregiver. Yes. What does that mean to you? Uh, that means to me that uh, while you can't hear them now because my wonderful wife has taken them out of the house, um, I have a beautiful four-year-old and an incredible two-year-old, and that is my main job. Um, when she is at work and sometimes when she's not, I get to be in charge of their care and feeding and instruction and so forth. So that's the main job. And uh, I get to also make videos as a side job and I'm writing and God willing, the writing will be the main source of income uh, before long. <laughs> All right, 30 years of writing, 30 years of writing means that you should have written quite a number of um, works. That is true. I, I have written a significant number. Okay. Can you just give us a brief, uh, like a brief outline of the things you've written so far? What areas do they cover? Sure. Um, I started a book when I was 10 that I gave up on when I was 11. That was basically a ripoff of a book I had read as a child. Um, I wrote a collection of short stories in junior high that were not very good. I wrote a uh, fantasy novel in high school that was not very good. Uh, the, for a while, I wrote things that were not very good. Um, but uh, as I got into my 20s, after hundreds of thousands of words of practice, I actually started to get an idea of how to write. And I probably did it the hard way. But And... Uh, I I hit my the end of my 20s. I was actually getting somewhere like I would enter a book into a contest and almost make the final round. Um, I had a different book that a New York editor asked to see more of if I made some significant changes. And being dumb at the time, I did not realize what a huge opportunity that was. And so never got back to her. Um, I, at the same conference where I had that possibility, I met another agent who asked to see the latest novel I had written. And though she passed on the project, she passed it over to a different editor, or different agent, excuse me. And that agent also passed, but I was getting to the point where there was some sparks of interest in the publishing world. And then I hit 30 and had been writing for 20 years. And suddenly I didn't have any words anymore. And God, very clearly encouraged me to just let it go. And for 10 years, I didn't write any fiction at all. And I didn't know if I'd ever write any again. And uh, to make the short story no longer than it has to be, um, I discovered in 2017 that you could self-publish without spending any money. And there were several books in my 20s that I'd worked so hard on and just wanted to see on a bookshelf. And so I published my baseball novel because I just really always wanted to have a published book. And then the next year I published my ice skating book because I got those picked up in wrong order. This is the baseball novel. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to have them out in the world to be able to say, look, I wrote a book. And then last year I went to write a book or to actually polish up and release a book I'd written in my late teens and discovered that it was terrible. And rather than just give up and publish something else, I decided why not try rewriting it? And it's a very long story I've, I've blogged about if people care, but uh, God was very gracious and gave me some extra inspiration. And as a result, I wrote a new book for the first time in 10 years. And this is the best thing I've ever written. It's called The Feud. I'm not great at self-promotion, but uh, if 
these words, these stories are at all inspiring. Anyone out there is welcome to download the Kindle free sample and start reading. And if you can get the end of what's free and you're like, I don't care, great. My hope is that you'll get to the end of what's free and say, okay, I want to spend some money and find out where the story goes. But regardless of how many people I can bless, and I hope it's billions, I'm very thankful just to have the words back and to be able to write and feel the joy in creation. I think that was answer to your question. I hope it was. Yes. Why were you called the busiest in your high school class? <laughs> I do put that in my bio. Um, so I, I'm not sure how uh, upper schooling might work in Nigeria. In the USA, um, we have high school that's generally age uh, 15 to 18. And as a senior, which was the last year of US high school, my fellow seniors, we would assign tags, for lack of a better word, to each other, who was the cleverest, who was the funniest, who had the coolest car. And anyway, I was voted busiest. I was writing for the school paper. I had a serial of my latest book in the school paper. I was in the school play. I was working at a television station. I was actually taking some classes. Um, and I also was filming a video for the senior class. Um, the job I had at the time was at a television station and they very graciously let me borrow a camera and run around my high school filming a video, which I'm still very proud of to this day. It was one of the most interesting things I've ever done, partly because when I started, I didn't know if I could complete it. But yeah, I had a lot of things going on. <laughs> Mark, do you have any question for yes. this? Uh, you just um, talked about rewriting the feud. And um, by your own reckoning, this is um, a very, that you feel fulfilled writing that. So can you tell us about the feud? I would love to. Um, so I always, I'm always curious where ideas come from for other writers. And as far as the feud goes, like I say, I wrote it when I was 17, I was still in high school. Uh, we had to read Romeo and Juliet. I might've been my senior year. And as I was reading Shakespeare's play, the thought struck me, what if a high school girl lived next door to a high school boy and their families had been fighting since before she had been born and she got the idea to get Romeo and Juliet to be the school play and ended up as the director and her younger sister, who's in love with the younger boy next door, which started the whole mess, be, were Romeo and Juliet. The whole idea being to get the fathers to come see the play and maybe they'll stop fighting after 20 years. And that idea, uh, which is a bit complicated, I'll admit, uh, struck me and just wouldn't let me go. And so I had to write the story to find out what happened, which is where they always come from. And I wrote it. Uh, when I was 17, I rewrote it when I was 18, thought it was good enough to be published. And fortunately, self-publishing was not a thing at the time, because like I say, when I went back to it last year, it was not good, but got the chance to rewrite it. And now it's really good. And I'm, I'm really proud of it. So what changes did you make? What changes did you make to that book uh, <laughs> to last year, right? Yes. Well, I, uh, I basically... The characters' names are the same. The basic plot elements are the same. It's, oh gosh, the difference between buying store-bought cookies and making your own cookies, maybe. Nothing against store-bought cookies, but you know how one is a lot more you. You can you can feel the love in the, the baking because a person did it by hand. The first time I wrote it, I was still doing it by hand, but I didn't know how to write. Um, so... I was telling a lot more than I was showing. The dialogue did not sound like it would come out of a teenager's mouth, which is ironic because I was a teenager <laughs> as I was writing it. Uh, so I took 20 years of learning how to write and took the story that deserved to be told and actually was able to tell it. Well, you are a comedian. How did you get into, be, uh, into that part of the, uh, of arts? Well, I How got into a comedian? improv what to comedy. Oh. What led to the comedy? Yes, what led to the comedy? So I, what led to the comedy? I was blessed to find an improv comedy group um, in 2008 when I was 30. And it was one of those groups anybody could join. And 
Uh, just really briefly, improvisational comedy, if you've ever seen Whose Line Is It Anyway, um, there's other uh, multimedia opportunities to watch improv. You go on stage and you get an idea and you do a scene with the other members of your team. It might be funny, it might be long, it might be short. Lots of times they're funny, but not always. Anyway, the big point of improv is that you don't have anything pre-planned. There's no script. You haven't learned any lines. You just step out and go. And it's a fantastic thing to do. I recommend it highly for anybody because you learn a lot about yourself and about trusting yourself and trusting other people. Anyway, after doing uh, improv for several years and getting on a, a team that people paid to see, um, I had thought, you know, it would be interesting to try stand-up comedy just once. And so I wrote some jokes because even though I wasn't writing fiction, I'm a writer, I have to write something. And I got up at an open mic and told my jokes and people laughed, possibly out of just niceness more than actually being amused, but they laughed and it was very addicting. And so for the next few years, I got up every chance I could and told jokes. Um, I got to where I needed to succeed at it. I made it too big a thing and kind of burned out. So I'm not currently doing any stand up, but I took all that writing I did when I started writing again and I've put a couple comedy essay books together, which is something else available on Amazon. If people find that funny, it's another thing you can get a Kindle free sample for and uh, try before you buy. Let's get back to your writing now. No writer writes in a vacuum. So what inspires you? What's your source of inspiration? Um, I am inspired. That's an excellent question, actually. I was going to make a joke about writing in a vacuum, like a vacuum cleaner, but that question is far too excellent for me to make that joke. Um, all of my fiction, certainly in the last 15 years, but possibly even back when I was writing terrible stuff, has always been about a person discovering who they really are. So the uh, ice skating book that my manager, you know, is like, please put the book up so people could see. Please, the, uh, it well. let, let get, let's get to see the cover well. Sure, the okay. ice skating book, ice skating um, book. The Silent Skater is on the surface, it's about a young lady um, trying to fit in with the last family she has left, her aunt and her cousin, because her parents have passed away, and the ice skating troupe that her aunt has, and whether or not they will be able to succeed and, and keep bringing in customers. What it's really about is the main character can't speak after the accident where she lost her parents. Something happened in her brain, and she can hear just fine, but she can't speak. And how is she going to relate to the world? And I'll tell you, it was quite a challenge I set for myself without realizing it because a character who can't talk, how do they go through a drive through How do they have a job? It, it makes life very challenging. And so it made the writing very challenging. But the book is really about, is Charlene going to accept who she is and be able to embrace the different way she has to deal with the world? Um, the feud, which I've been talking about. And again, I'll put the cover up because I'm supposed to do that. Um, on the surface, it's about Andy, my main character, directing the school play and trying to get her father, her father and the, the boy next door's father to stop fighting. But what it's really about, Andy has a physical challenge and uh, it's kind of an important part of the book and I'm supposed to you know make you excited to read it so I'm not going to tell you what it is but she has a, a disfigurement and everybody that meets her relates to her through that difference and the challenge of the book is is she going to be able to see herself as she really is and love herself as she really is or let other people define her so my books are always about that. There's always there's something going on, the interesting keep you reading part, but then there's what's really going on. And it's always about a person, whether or not they're going to embrace who they really are, because apparently that's a really important story that I want to keep telling because I tell it over and over. OK, do you ascribe to the thinking that a writer must necessarily hold up the mirror to society? No, I don't think a writer necessarily has to do that. Um, I'm not even sure whether or not I do that. I just write the stories that grab me by the collar and beg me to write them. Mark, over to you. Okay. Um, the theme you have explained now, which guides your writing, is that the same thing for the kids? 
So tell us about the kid, the, the book, the book you wrote called The Kid. Well, I would love to. Um, and I can even hold this one up and be, you know, a good marketing person. Um, so the idea for the kid I had so long ago that I was I was small enough I could stand on my bed back then. So I might have been seven or eight. I was a small child, but um, I was having this baseball fantasy as a lot of kids are known to do. So I was I was up to bat and it was the bottom of the ninth in the seventh game of the World Series. And I cracked the imaginary ball over the fence. Grand slam home run. I just won the game. And for some reason, this time having that particular uh, fantasy, I thought, what if I didn't run the bases? Which, I don't know, I might have been the first person to ever have that thought, but it would not let me go. It's like, what would make a person have that moment, accomplish that goal, and then turn around and walk away? And like I've said with the, the other books, I had to write this to find out why, what, what would put a person through that. So it's possibly the least of the books that I have allowed the world to see. Um, I, I do not claim that it's historical fiction, even though it takes place in the uh, late forties because historical fiction is actually well-researched and I just kind of guessed. So uh, you'll have to give me some slack on that, but it's a good story and much like the story is on the surface it's about whether or not the uh, 1948 boston braves can take this new rookie that they immediately dub the kid who can hit balls out of the stadium like nobody's business can they actually go and win the world series for the first time that's what the book is supposed to be about but what it's really about is jason stiller going to be able to forgive his father, who he has been angry about, angry at, excuse me, because he feels that the man's responsible for his mother's death. So it's not just about baseball. And uh, anyway, you get to the point near the end where he does crack that ball over the fence and then he turns and then he walks away and you know why by then. But like I said, I had to write the story to find out. Go ahead. Okay, Will. No, that's fine. That's fine. And um, what's so special about baseball in America? Um, it's not. It's not a game that is very common here. To be honest, I'm not sure. I know, um, and I will. I'll tell just you too, because I don't want anybody else to hear this. Um, I'm not a big fan of baseball, so the fact that I would write an entire book surrounding it is a little odd. Um, I'm a much bigger fan of American football, but like I say, when a story grabs me by the collar, I just, I'm not a huge fan of ice skating either. Although I've watched plenty of, uh, skating in the Olympics. I used to watch it with my parents growing up. Again, it's the story that drives me, even if it's about a subject I've previously never been that interested in. Um, the book I'm writing right now, the main character is a falconer. And I didn't know beans about falconry until I started writing the book, but I've found out quite a bit. It's actually a fascinating subject, but you know, that's a nice thing about being a writer. You get to learn about all these worlds you never would experience. Okay. There's a question that I want to ask. What is it about writing? Why not a different profession? Maybe a boxer or a, a sprinter or something like that. Why, why the art of writing for you as a person? That is a good question. I can say not a sprinter because uh, my chest hurts when I run. So that one was out. Um, it's, I, I will say if you're, if you're out there and you have a book in mind that you've never written, I absolutely encourage you to write it because much like trying stand up comedy, which is something else everybody thinks about doing and hardly anybody does do it one time, if only that, and you will have accomplished something. It's, it's good for the soul, but writing as a profession is very, very difficult. Um, I want, I'm going to quote somebody, I think it was William Saroyan who said, writing is the hardest possible way to earn a living with the possible exception of wrestling alligators. Um, there are so many easier ways, but at least for me, I can't not write. It's just in my DNA. Even the 10 years that I wasn't writing fiction, I still wrote um, a series of books nitpicking popular movies. I wrote 150 pages of stand-up comedy. I wrote in journals. I wrote all sorts of things. I just wasn't writing novels. 
Um, it's what I'm here to do. And as I said, I'm very blessed to know that. Um, that's something else I encourage people is what would you do if you could do anything? Because a lot of people, when I ask them that, don't have an answer. And if you don't know the answer, it's hard to accomplish a goal you don't have. So for anybody listening, if you've never asked yourself that question, it's a good one. For those of us, for those of you who are just joining us, this is Mindfield Publishing Facebook Live Author Series, and I'm chatting with author Will Nestle. He's the author of several books. we have just seen one of them, The Feud, The Kid, and the, and the sketching book that he showed us. My co-host for today is none other than Dr. Chibuke Marco Guabo, the author of The Bombos and the Wabi, number one Amazon bestseller. It became an Amazon bestseller about three weeks back. And so today we have an exciting moment with our author guest, Will. Will is congratulations, from Colorado Dr. Mark. Thank Sorry, you, congratulations, Will. Dr. Mark. Thank you, Will. That was an amazing, that was an amazing story, a story written for my kids. But um, which surprised me, surprised that then too, 72 hours after it was published, became a, became number one on the best selling list in its category. Fantastic. That was quite an interesting run. That was a, just a little uh, digression. Back to you, Will. Tell us, if you were to advise aspiring writers, what would it be? If I wanted to do what? To advise aspiring writers to up their game, what would it be? To advice for other writers to up their game, um, I doubt I'm going to say anything that hasn't been said many times before. Um, read. If you're not reading a ton, like whenever you're not writing, then that's a problem. Um, and I say this given that I haven't read much in the past week, although I've been beta reading a lot, so I get to read other people's stuff. But um, the single best way to learn how to write is writing, and the second best way is reading. Um, read stuff that's good so you can try to understand how they do it. And the more you read, the more I think the understanding of how to do it becomes ingrained instead of having to sit there going, okay, how are they developing this character? Why is this good dialogue? You'll just get a feel for it. Um, and then write, 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 write. I don't recommend publishing the first thing you ever write. Um, I say that, A, knowing people aren't going to believe me, and two, knowing I would not have believed me if I was hearing me say this 30 years ago, because everything I've ever written, I thought should be published. And it's only now that I can look back and say, wow, everything I wrote for the first 15 years is terrible. Um, it was not good. And again, I started when I was 10. I don't know that uh, 15 years is an average for people learning how to write. I'm sure it could be done much faster than that when you're not also you know, going to math class and so forth. But if, if you have one story in you, absolutely write that one story. And then if you really feel after you've put it away for a couple months and gone back to it and read it again, that it is absolutely fantastic, great. Have a couple other people read it, people that you know don't owe you money and see what they say. And it's it's a challenge to find people who will be honest and also kind, but they're out there. But if if writing is something you can't not do, as uh, I think it was Daniel Close who said it that way, then by all means do it and keep doing it and challenge yourself. Find other people that you can encourage. Um, read, like I say, everything you can. Read your own stuff out loud. Um, whenever I'm, I don't think I've ever done a beta read where I've gotten the chance to read someone else's work and encourage them where I haven't encouraged the writer, have you read this out loud? Because, and I need to tell myself that over and over because there is no better way to hear where a sentence has too many words, where dialogue just isn't flowing like it would in real life than just by hearing your words come out of your or someone else's mouth. So read, keep writing, read your stuff out loud and do it if you have to do it. But if you can live with yourself doing anything else, it's probably gonna be easier because writing is very, very difficult. It's very rewarding eventually, and it can be rewarding right from the beginning if you don't push yourself as hard as I did, but it's not easy. 
you've been writing for 30 years. How yes. are you able to sustain the momentum from the one to this point? What really uh, kept you going? That is an excellent question. Um, the, taking the 10 years off didn't hurt, especially since in that time I went from beating myself up to write better to loving myself, whether I wrote it at all and being okay with whatever I produce, which interestingly enough, I'm writing more as well as better than I ever did. Um, so I, what helps now is just that it's so much fun. I'm it's, just become such a joy to write. I look forward almost every time I get to sit down. And like I say, the times where I don't look forward to it, I tell myself that I'm not allowed to write that day. And usually within a few hours the next day, I want to get back to it. So it's a huge blessing to be a writer, especially if you can let yourself be the writer you are instead of beating yourself to be the writer you want to be, if that makes any sense. Mark, over to you. Dr. Mark, over to you. Uh oh, we lost Dr. Mark. Dr. Mark, was it something I said? Okay, I'm sure he'll join us shortly. What are the themes you explore in your writing? Um, I don't set out to write one of the things I don't do is, at least I try not to do, is set out with a message in mind, like I'm going to write a book about not polluting, or I'm going to write a book about saving the rainforest. Um, the stories that I write, sometimes there are messages in them, or I want to say I want, that they have themes. I'd like to think I'm a good enough writer that I don't have messages, I have themes, so that and the difference being um, a lot of books you know your books, movies, a lot of just media, you know you're getting a message when the main part is what they want you to believe when you're done. Not the characters, not the plot, but what I'm trying to get across. Whereas a book has a theme if the characters and the plot are the important thing. And by the way, in the background, maybe start thinking about not polluting, maybe start thinking about social justice or whatever. I'm picking random things out of my head. Um, so in the kid, the baseball novel, um, there's a theme about greed, but I didn't set out to write a book about greed. Um, the silent skater has a theme about accepting people, even that are different, and about family, very strong family theme. Um, the feud also has a very strong family theme, and also reading between the lines, and sometimes every now and again, not even between the lines, there's a very strong pro-forgiveness theme. Um, not only is the hopeful outcome of the feud that Andy's father and the father of the boy next door will stop fighting after 20 years, but Andy gets challenged about somebody she's fighting with, um, a fellow senior in the course of the book. And I didn't set out to write a book on forgiveness, but as I went, that's just how the story turned out. So I just kind of start writing and uh, let the themes tap me on the shoulder as I go. <laughs> Dr. Mark, you were about asking a question. Yes. Um, Welcome back. Yes, we missed thank you. Thank you. I, I just had a small connection glitch, but uh, anyway, I'm back. Uh, Fire at Will seems to be a collection of um, your comedy, comedy story or something yes. like that. All right, so I know Edento had already asked you why comedy. Maybe this is also an opportunity for you to expound on um, your comedy foray. I love expounding. Um, yes, so in the course of trying to get good at stand-up comedy, um, and I'm very blessed that living in Colorado as I do, Denver has a big comedy scene. There are opportunities that any random person who thinks they could be a comic can get up on stages that you might have to be on a waiting list for months and months in other places. Um, but I wrote I wrote comedy about having newborn kids. I wrote comedy about martial arts training. I wrote comedy about motorcycles. I wrote comedy about, like I said, I have a 150 page document on my computer that's just comedy joke ideas. Um, and that's, that's a whole bunch of jokes. And so when I got burned out, 
and, and it's like I lost the funny. I'm not feeling being on stage anymore. But I had all this comedy sitting there. Um, I grew up reading Dave Barry books. He's a columnist, or at least was. I don't know if he still is for the Miami Herald. And he has books that are just collections of his columns and books that are just little bits of things he finds funny. And between him and Garrison Keillor and Robert Benchley and others, I thought, well, gosh, I have all this comedy that I've written. It would be nice if it was in convenient book form. And I'll admit I didn't grab one of those off the shelf when I came to do this, but uh, I have a couple comedy essay books also on Amazon. Um, and the first one, there's bits about superheroes and there's bits about changing poopy diapers and there's bits about changing poopy superhero diapers. No, but uh, just things that I found funny and that made me laugh while I was writing them that hopefully would make people laugh as they were reading them, so. Who are your role models? in the literary field? That is a good question. Um, there are, I, I've read many, many authors and love many, many authors. So uh, you can see behind me, um, I've read almost all of those and almost all of those I've read more than once. But as far as writers where I will read anything they've ever put on paper, even if it's a grocery list, C.S. Lewis, uh, William Goldman and Tom Wolfe. Uh, William Goldman wrote The Princess Bride. He's also written several books on uh, screenwriting. C.S. Lewis, oh golly, the, the Narnia Chronicles, uh, Mere Christianity, The Screwtape Letters, and Tom Wolfe. I started with The Right Stuff, probably read that half a dozen times as a teenager, and then moved on to the more flowery, esoteric works. But I'll read just about anything. What's a blessing is, and hopefully people can say this about my stuff, is when I get started and I don't want to put the book down. And now that I'm more critical of my writing and I've helped to encourage and, and give critiques to other people's writing, it's harder to just pick up a random book and not sit there thinking, you know, the character development should be moving along a little faster, or gosh, that dialogue didn't sound real. <laughs> so it's rude to be a little bit for just reading things, but. So what do you want to be remembered for? Say again? What do you want to be rem remembered for as a writer? What memory do you want to leave behind? What legacy do you want to leave behind as a writer? Ah, uh, you're breaking up, sir. Is the question, what do what I want to be remembered for? What, what legacy, legacy do you intend to leave behind as a writer? Absolutely. Um, I am hoping that my words get to bless millions of people but they've blessed tens of people, and that's a good beginning. Um, what I would love to be remembered for is the same thing that I've been so blessed by people behind me, is telling stories that not only entertained, but also encouraged. Um, I, as I grew up, I was the shortest kid in my class. I was the first kid to get glasses. I read a lot, partly because I didn't know how to interact with the kids around me. And some of that wasn't especially healthy, but while I was reading everything I could get my hands on, I would put myself in the shoes of whoever the hero was of whatever story I was reading. And when I was reading, I felt stronger. I felt braver. I felt more me. And I started writing because I enjoyed that feeling so much. I wanted to just make more of it. So if any of my books inspire people to be more themselves, to love themselves more, to try things that scare them, to just live better lives, it will all have been worth it. Mark, over to you. Yes, um, just a bit of digression. What kind of small business do you run beyond um, your rights in business? I am very blessed. I told you that I was uh, filming the senior class when I was a senior in high school. And uh, not long thereafter, I founded a videography business and I get to, I haven't done a lot of it the last few months because the world got weird, but I'm uh, very blessed that I get to film at schools and also for dance companies. I film shows that are put on stage and uh, people buy copies and somehow people keep giving me money and uh, it's been paying for life for almost 20 years now, which is just incredible. <laughs> Okay. Viewers, we are on to Mindful Publishing, Facebook Live Author Interview Series, and we have with us 
a special guest. We are with Nestle from Colorado, USA. And my co host is no other person than Dr. Chibuke Mark Obobo, the best selling author of The Bumbles and the Wabbit. Chibuke, over to you. Yeah, uh, Will, thank you very much. I'm sure that you've had, is there, is there that one or two challenges that have um that you have faced as a writer and overcome that you would like to share with um budding writers absolutely i would the greatest challenge as a writer i think is probably the greatest challenge anybody would have in any profession um at least anybody who was uh, uh, I hate when I can't think of the word I want. Um, my my grandfather was a perfectionist. My father is a perfectionist. I call myself a recovering perfectionist. And so, the greatest challenge in writing, and whether I had, you know, if I was a locomotive engineer, or if I was an astronaut, whatever I set out to do, the greatest challenge was going to be letting myself fail. Um, I don't know if it's common for everybody to have as much struggle with failure as I do, but it is an essential part of life. The only way I've found to not fail at something is to not try something, and then you failed to try something, so you're still failing. Um, but while it's, I don't expect it to ever not be a problem, I can fail at things now, and it's just a little twin instead of just laying me out flat. So it's okay to fail. Um, I still remember where I was sitting when a counselor told me that a long time ago. And there are people probably hearing my voice that don't believe it anymore than I believed it then, but it's still true. The only way not to fail is not to do anything. And that's failure at life. So go out, try things and it's okay. How do people assess your book? Are they online? Are they on Amazon, on Bains and Noble or on Kobo? How do they assess it? Amazon.com has uh, the stuff I've given to the world. Um, God willing, there's an agent and a traditional publisher in my near future. But uh, as for right this second, if you go to Amazon.com and put in the name that you see on the screen, you can uh, download those Kindle free samples, like I mentioned earlier. And I cannot say it enough. Please try a free sample. And if you can stop, do. My hope is that uh, you won't be able to. And then you can give me money, which is always nice. <laughs> What will be your last word to the viewers out there who are watching you live now? You always, you guys ask such great questions. I appreciate that. Um, live. There's, there's so much life out there. Um, ask, ask yourself, what would I do if I could do anything? And then try to find a way to do that, whatever that thing is, unless it hurts other people. But what we were, I believe everyone is made for something and very few of us find that thing. And that makes me sad. So don't make me sad. Find the thing you were made for and create, experience, live, and uh, and be passionate. Mark, what is your last word before we wrap up this show? Well, um, it's been a great time chatting with Will. And it's not all the time you find someone with a lot of varied talents um, put together in one in one whole, and um, the opportunity today uh, with Will explaining all the different things that he has done and the encouragement um, he has obtained over time, which he's sharing with um, writers today, I think has been quite rewarding. Thank you for this opportunity once again, Will, to have you and uh, Edentu. And uh, for the readers, the Bombos will be coming with the sequel before the year runs out. I hope that uh, people will be blessed again. Will has used the word blessing a lot today, blessing people with your work. So I hope you'll be blessed a lot with the sequel, the way the first one came up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will, for this great um, interview that you've granted us. Uh, viewers out there, go and get his books, The Kid, The Feud, and The Skating Book, the baseball book, right? Lovely books, go and get them out there and 
Also for my co-host, the best-selling author of the Bombos and the Wabi. Here it is, Bombos and the Wabi. Go and get your copy. Thank you for watching. We'll meet you some other time. Cheers. Much obliged. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.